right, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, you should hopefully be able to see that now. All right, so we are going to pick up our study on the first kings of Israel. We've been going through this just kind of uh, intermittently for a little while now, but we're just kind of going through and looking, you know, we first started with Saul. Now we're into um, the life of David more so. Um, at this point, we're in 2 Samuel. And as we go through this, just keep in mind, um, this is kind of an interesting part of scripture where it's just a lot of history. It kind of explains what happened, what David did, what Saul did. Um, there's some narration um, that's given that kind of frames it in a light, whether positive or negative. Uh, so some things are portrayed like David did something. This was wonderful. Other things are shown that he did that were less than ideal. Um, so I don't want anyone to get the idea that just because David did something, that's what we are exactly supposed to do or not do. Uh, this is a different time in history. It's a different time of the world and in a very specific circumstance of him being the king. But um, I think we can still get a lot of uh, encouragement out of looking at the life of David, the way God worked through him, the way that he served God in certain ways, and the way that God, most importantly, worked to um, support his people and to bring about his um, promises and his things through people that are less than perfect. Um, and then David happens to be one of those. <clears throat> so what we're doing here is we're picking up the story shortly after David is made king over both um, Judah and Israel. So it was the nation was split after Saul's death. David had a portion of the uh, country, which was Judah. And then, you know, they, um, Saul's son was a king over the other tribes. And then we saw, I think it was last session, we the kind of being united together. David is now the king over all of this um, kingdom of Israel. Um, and then I think where we ended off last time was that David decided to move to Jerusalem and kind of put his house there. And then he just continued to be victorious in these different military battles. It was a very um, <clears throat> rough time as far as <laughs> being a nation with others around that were always trying to war, to take over, to um, raid and steal wealth, um, people. It was just a difficult time to be alive it seems like at that point there's a lot of war a lot of battles a lot of threats on every side at every time uh, for the most part all right so um kind of like we've been doing for this series it's going to be doing a lot of scripture reading uh, i'll make a few little comments along the way but just kind of read and let uh it speak for itself to some degree so we're going to pick up in second samuel chapter six verse one <clears throat> now david again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring in, bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the cart. And they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the cart. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. So to backtrack a little bit, the ark had previously been captured by the Philistines. But after its possession had brought them some problems, they sent it back to Israel. And it was stored in the land of Kiriath um, Jerem in the house of Abinadab for, I believe it was around 20 plus years um, during some of the reign of uh, Saul and now David. So, with David now as king over both Judah and Israel, um, he goes along with an army of men to bring back this Ark of God into Jerusalem. And this was, you know, David's new capital city. So it kind of makes sense that he wants to have everything consolidated there. Um, and this event is obviously something of a celebration. And you see David and the men of Israel, they're playing instruments and they're, you know, kind of celebrating with 
sounds like a fun party to be a part of to me. They're all dancing and um, playing instruments and, you know, walking back with this arc and round. All right, so when they came to the fleshing or the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of God burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence. And he died there by the ark of, the, of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So this is an interesting little happening here. So just along the journey, you know, one of the ox kind of stumbles. So uh, Uzzah reached out and kind of steadied it. He, he sounds like he was trying to keep it from falling, but he was punished very severely for that action. Um, and, you know, the reason why it says it was because of his irreverence, but, you know, only priests were allowed to touch the holy things of God. So um, they should have clearly known that this was not a thing to just be, you know, just throw the ark on a cart and just kind of drag it around. They should have had some more reverence for it and been taking this seriously. Um, so that it was a uh, kind of a serious grievance the way they were treating the ark here. And uh, there was a consequence for that. Um, I mean, really what we see here is that respect and reverence for God and his ark, it's not something to be taken lightly or just cavalierly. But after David witnessed the punishment for this unrespectful treatment of the ark, he decided that he was unwilling to finish bringing it to Jerusalem. And he, instead, he just left it um, at the house of Obed-Edom, which kind of a side note there, since he was a Gittite, that was someone from Gath, which was a land in the Philist a, a city in the Philistine land. So he leaves it with this guy that was from the Philistine land. All right, so continuing on. Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. David went and brought up the ark from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. So it's just an interesting story here. Um, obviously, with the ark being left behind, um, it remained in this house and this household they prospered for the three months that it was there and then David gets informed of that and he's like okay well if the ark's you know prospering this guy then maybe it's not so scary and he decides you know let's go ahead and bring it to Jerusalem after all um, and it doesn't give you know a lot of detail up here of how they brought it in but um, if you actually read the record I think it's in Chronicles first Chronicles there's a little more detail of how it was brought up by the priests and such but it was brought in with a little bit more of a respectful um, manner uh, than just throwing it kind of on a cart and letting it bounce around. Um, but again, they kind of pick up the celebration. They're excited to have the ark coming into Jerusalem. They're, you know, bringing it up with the shouting and sound of a trumpet. So it's an exciting time. Okay, start it. continuing on, verse 16. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, which we know that's Jerusalem, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people 
in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both to men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his own house. But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants. Maids, as one of the foolish ones, shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate the Lord. I will be lightly, I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you've spoken, with them I will be distinguished. Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children or no child to the day of her death. So Michal, will remember, this is David's first wife. She was the daughter of Saul that was given to him by Saul. And that was actually kind of meant to be a snare to David when Saul gave it to gave him uh, Michal. Um, but anyway, this, you know, first wife, she's back um, with David in the city of Jerusalem. She kind of despised David when she saw him dancing before Yahweh in his ark. Um, she came out to meet David and she uh, chastised him. You kind of see here, it sounds like a sarcastic way uh, but for his dancing before the ark of God. Uh, and we see what David said here. This is countered her uh, chastisement with a pretty sharp response saying that God had chosen him, David, over Saul, her father, and over um, their family as the ruler of Israel. And then there's a little side note there at the bottom that she had no child to the day of her death. So um, she was not, you know, blessed in that way. Okay, going on to chapter seven. Starting with verse one here. <clears throat> now it came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan, the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your mind for the Lord is with you. But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may live in their own place and may and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. And when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with a rod of men and with the strokes of the son of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, 
Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is a big deal here. This is after many stressful years of battle. We you know, read previously about all the different battles that David had been in fighting. Um, even before um, he was made king, he was you know, fighting battles before Saul. Um, so he's had all these battles and you know, he thinks now that things are a little bit calmer, it's, you know, things have died down. He's got some rest. He thinks it'd be a good idea to build a house for Yahweh. God, however, spoke to David through his prophet Nathan and told him that he would rather make a house for David and David's descendant would be the one to build a house for Yahweh. And there's some pretty um, special language in here about how, you know, while Saul was removed and David was made king, that's not going to happen, that David's descendants um, will be on the throne um, and have the kingdom forever. Uh, that's a big deal. Okay, continuing on. Pick up in verse 16. In accordance with all these words and with this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Then David, the king, went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is the custom of man, O Lord God. Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God, for the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness to let your servant know. For this reason, you are great, O Lord God. There is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation on earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to a name for himself. And to do great thing for you and an awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed to, for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. For you have established yourself for yourself, your people, Israel and your people forever. And you, O Lord, have become their God. Now, therefore, O Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken that your name may be magnified forever by saying, the Lord of hosts is God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made a revelation to your servant, saying, I will build your house. Therefore, your servant has found the courage to pray this prayer to you. Now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are truth, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. I don't really have a whole lot to say on this, other than it's just a really good example of David's love and his awe for God, and this includes a prayer at the end that it may come to pass what God had said. Very encouraging uh, section to read, though. Okay, now we're going to get into a little bit more about the battles that David continued to have. Um, first, uh, Second Samuel 8, starting at verse 1. Now after this, it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. David took control of the chief city of the land, hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab. He measured them with a line, making them lie down to the ground. And he measured two lines to put to death and one full line to keep alive. And the Moabites became servants to David, bringing tribute. Then David defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah, and he went to restore his rule at the river. David captured from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. David hamstrung the chariots, but he reserved enough of them, the chariot horses, but reserved enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 Arameans. Then David put garrisons among the Arameans of Damascus, and the Arameans became servants of David, bringing tribute. And the Lord helped David wherever he went. 
David took the shields of gold, which they carried, were carried by the servants of Hadadezer, and brought them to Jerusalem. From Batah to Berthe, cities of Hadadezer, King David took a very large amount of bronze. So again, and we already know this, but David was a very skilled military leader. He won many battles. Um, obviously, God was helping him to do that. It says the Lord helped him wherever he went. Um, but during this military battles, um, Israel captured several items of wealth uh, that brought into the land. Um, this also helped Israel to capture land and retain land in, in the area, which also strengthened this kingdom. So whenever the enemies would come up against Israel and try to take over, they would actually end up giving their wealth to um, David and the people of Israel. So, and you see God's protection over his promised uh, land, his promised people. Now, when Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, Toy sent Joram, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him, because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had been at war with Toy. And Joram brought with him articles of silver and gold and bronze. King David also dedicated these to the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Arab to Aram to Moab, the sons of Ammon to the Philist and the Philistines and Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. So David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000 Arameans in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons in Edom. In all Edom, he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became servants to David, and the Lord helped David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. Joab, the son of, of Zeruiah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilahud, was recorder. Zadok, the son of Ahitab, and Ahimelech, the son of Apithar, were priests. And Sarah was secretary. Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers. And I apologize. I probably did not catch all of those names 100% properly, but that's uh, about the best I can do on those. Um, but here we see, you know, again, David's military success became known to others um, in the area. He received treasure from those he conquered, as well as others that either just wanted to become an ally uh, to avoid the same fate, or those that were just glad to hear about his conquest of a mutual enemy. I do think it's interesting to note that the narrative clearly uh, notes that he received help from Yahweh. Um, and also, especially interesting notice here that says that David reigned over people, over Israel, and he administered justice and righteousness for his people. So what a good king is supposed to do. Okay. A little bit of a shift here in the story. So we're going to see something unique here. This is the part I really like. Uh, going to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, saying, The king, <clears throat> they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to, Saul, to, to the king, There is a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is the house of Nikur the son of Emil in Lodipar. The king David sent and brought him from the house of, of uh, Machir and the son of Emil from Lodabar, Meth, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself and said, 
What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? So this passage, I think, really is wonderful in how it portrays the heart of David. So even while he's in power and in a place where many would just be inclined to forget about others, um, David here, he wants to show kindness to the house of Saul and specifically Jonathan. So he finds a servant of the house of Saul and he inquired, you know, is there any descendants of Saul that I can show some kindness to? And he's told that there is a son of Jonathan who is crippled. And if we remember, this was actually kind of a little side note, one of the earlier um, sessions on the kings of Israel that we read where there's this um, story of how he became um, crippled. Um, but the, that son of Jonathan, he was named uh, Methibosheth and was called out before David. Basically, when he arrives, he falls down in respects to David. Um, and one could speculate here that he may have been concerned that David wanted to eliminate him as a potential heir to the kingdom of Saul. That would have been the more normal thing for a king to do when they become into power is to seek out anyone else that would have any type of challenge to the, the throne and you know have them executed or uh, banished or something along those lines. Uh, however, David here is looking to show him kindness and instead says, don't fear, I'm going to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'm going to give you back this land that used to be Saul's. So really cool uh, um, little uh, note here about how David just shows kindness. So continuing on, then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to all his house, I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. You shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant to do, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at the king's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Mika, who also lived in the house of Ziba, with, were servants to uh, Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, where he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. So in this great act of kindness, again, we just see that David gave this grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, he gave him all that belonged to Saul, including this land, the servants that, you know, produced um, from the land. And he gave him an invitation to eat at the uh, table of David, the table of the king, and which he did with David's son. So uh, really kind of a neat little thing that David here does to show kindness rather than trying to um, make people fear him and um, see how harsh he is. He's trying to show kindness. He's trying to do the right thing. All right, continuing on now, chapter 10. Now it happened afterwards that the king of the Ammonites died and Hanan, the son, became king in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahesh, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent some of the servants to console him concerning his father. But when David's servants came to the land of the Ammonites, the prince of the Ammonites said to Hanan, their lord, do you think that David is honoring your father because he has sent consolers to you? Has David not sent his servants to you in order to search the city, to spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved off half their beards and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips and sent them away. And when they told it to David, he sent to meet them for the men were greatly humiliated. And the king said, stay at Jericho until your beards grow and then return. Now, when the sons of Ammon saw that they had become odious to David, the sons of Ammon sent and hired Arameans of beth Rohab and the Arameans of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Mecca with 1,000 men, and the men of Tob with 12,000 men. When David heard it, that he sent Joab and all the army, the mighty men, the sons of Ammon came out and drew up in battle to array at the entrance of the city, while the Arameans of Zobah and Rahab and the men of Tob and Malchah were there themselves in the field. So this interesting passage, we saw David sought to show some kindness, 
to this newly appointed king of the Ammonites, but instead of being received, David's men bearing the message were rejected and humiliated. Uh, when the offenders realized that they may have now reason to fear David, after humiliating his messengers, they hire an army. And then now when Joab, that's Joab's the leader of the Israelite army. Now when Joab saw the battle was set against him in front and in the rear, he selected of all choice men of Israel and arrayed them against the Arameans. But the remainder of the people he placed in the hand of Abishai, his brother, and he arrayed them against the sons of Ammon. And he said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the sons of Ammon are too strong for you, I will come to help you. Be strong and let us show ourselves courage for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to the battle against the Arameans and they fled before him. When the sons of Ammon saw that the Arameans fled, they also fled before Abishai and entered the city. Then Joab returned from fighting against the sons of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. When the Arameans saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadadezer sent and brought out the Arameans who were beyond the river. And now when they came down to Helam, and Shobach, the commander of the army of Hadadezer, led them. And when it was told to David, he gathered all Israel together and crossed the Jordan and came to Helam. And the Arameans arrayed themselves to meet David and fought against him. But the Arameans fled before Israel, and David killed 700 charioteers, and the Arameans and of the Arameans and 40,000 horsemen and struck down Shobach, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings, servants of Hadadezer, saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Arameans feared to help the sons of Ammon anymore. So here we see more battles. <laughs> it's a continual thing. Uh, Joab, the commander of the Israelite army, um, he did some strategic planning here. They went out to battle, and the hired army, they saw this um, Joab and the Israelite army approaching. They fled, but then when the sons of Ammon saw that their hired army had fled, they also followed suit, and, you know, Israel goes back to Jerusalem. They're like, all right, that was easy. Then the opposing forces, they go, and they call in more reinforcements, and they, pray, they prepare for an even bigger battle um, against Israel. So to combat that larger uh, gathering of forces, David then gathers all of Israel and they went and they crossed the Jordan and they fought and they won this great victory to the point that the Arameans are just no longer even willing to help the people of Ammon anymore. They're just, they're done. It was too great of a defeat. Um, and we see that it's because of that, these other um, kings, these other nations, they actually became somewhat of servants to Israel and David. All right, so I know we've covered a lot. Uh, we're going to just wrap it up here, kind of the conclusion, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. But basically, what we see here is David's reign as king it was definitely not easy. There were many enemies surrounding Israel, and there was this persistent threat of war. It seems like, you know, every, every so often there was just another battle that they had to go uh, fight. David, however, though, he's this great warrior, and we're told that God helped him wherever he went. Um, so I think several times there we saw that David was shown to be victorious. And then the note there from the narration is God was with him. So it wasn't just David doing this on his own. Also, I think especially it was that David, instead of seeking to destroy and extinguish any descendants of Saul and potential claims to the throne, instead he sought to show kindness to the crippled son of Jonathan. In doing so, I think that showed that he's a person of character, um, and that he respected people of character like Jonathan. And he wished to show respect for him by caring for his son. Uh, David also sought to show kindness to another descendant of a neighboring king. However, that time it was rejected with uh, intent of humiliation. And this led to a battle and a great victory of David and Israel over them and their hired army. So finally, though, through all this, I think we can see that David is portrayed by this narration in a very positive light as a nearly ideal king, um, at least up to this point. 
He brought military victory and safety to his people. Um, that came with bringing in a lot of wealth to the country as well, um, establishing the lands. Also, we were told that David administered justice and righteousness over the people of Israel. That's what you want a king to do. So it's what specifically the king of Israel was supposed to do, um, as Israel was supposed to be um, a witness to other countries and other nations that they could see when a country followed God in his ways, how things would work out. But um, I think because of this, it's just portraying David as a great king. He's following God's intentions um, and things are working out well. God's, you know, with him, God's blessing his, his actions. Um, and it's interesting because even though before when we read it, that, you know, with started of Saul, uh, God didn't really intend for there to be a king of Israel. That wasn't what he originally wanted, but um, originally God was supposed to be the king of Israel and they were supposed to be following his prophets and his judges. But even now God is working through these Kings. He's still working through uh, people to accomplish his um, goals and his um, ideas for this nation of Israel. And David is working as a part of that. So I am going to go ahead and stop my screen sharing here. Um, I'm actually going to close out the recording and then we'll have some discussion. So if you didn't catch the discussion, I hope you join us next time in person.